accommodating <laughs> when I ask favors. So that's great. He's a forest ecosystem scientist whose research focuses on forest carbon management, climate change impacts on forested ecosystems, ecologically based silviculture systems, sustainable forest management policy, both in the US and internationally. And of course, today's topic, uh, the structure and function of old growth. His master's degree is from the Yale University uh, and he got his PhD in University of Washington. So he brings that uh, sort of bi-coastal uh, learning. Um, currently he's teaching at University of Mont Vermont, uh, but uh, I'm particularly appreciative of his presenting today because he's just coming back from a sabbatical in Austria, uh, in which was partly connected to his work with the IUFRO working group on old growth. So it's really good of you to shoehorn this in here at the end of the year. And uh, I will, so again, for those of you who just joined, we are recording this and uh, the recording will be available. We're probably gonna go a little more than an hour today. So if uh, your schedule doesn't allow you to stay on, the recording will be available. Uh, and throughout, if you have questions or comments, please go ahead and use the chat window. We'll keep up a little bit of dialogue uh, on there. So Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Xander. Really appreciate the invitation to join you today. And thanks everyone for, for attending. I'm really excited to talk about this. Old growth forests are really my, my passion. Um, they are arguably why I'm in this field to begin with. I've been working in this field of old growth ecology, as Xander said, ever since actually my, my master's student days way back in the early 90s. And, and my, my, my love and interest in old growth forests has just continued ever since. Um, recently, as Andrew said, I've been primarily working abroad on temperate old growth systems in, on a number of different continents, and, um, and I'm currently chairing the IUFRO Working Group on Old Growth Forests. And so today I thought I would try to share a little bit of this global perspective. You know, I got my start in the Pacific Northwest, where I know many of you guys are, um, and then I've, and I've, you know, tr tr try to transfer or maybe share some of those ideas and, and, and lessons elsewhere in the country and in the world. But over time, I've really become aware that um, there are people interested in this topic of management for old forest characteristics, restoration of old forests, the role of old, old forests um, throughout the world. And, and there are great ideas now that we can draw on and, and learn from literally on, on every continent. So um, I, I hope to share some of that with you today. Okay, so when we talk about old growth temperate forests, you know, we often have in mind something like this. Uh, this is one of our old growth hemlock hardwood forests across Lake Champlain from where I am right now in Vermont in the Adirondack State Park. And we think of this structural complexity that you're seeing here, the higher density of large trees, the downwoody debris, the trees of all sizes and, 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 and uh, ages, the vertical complexity, the patch complexity and horizontal structure, uh, these characteristics that, that we think of as comprising a late successional or old forest. And of course, we're interested in the functions that those structures provide in terms of habitat for, for biodiversity, in terms of carbon storage, in terms of hydrologic regulation and other ecosystem services. But I hope to impress upon you today that in many cases, this archetype that we have in our mind of old forest structure is in fact highly variable. And for temperate forests throughout the world manifest late successional structural characteristics in different ways, depending on site, depending on their natural disturbance history, depending on the, their uh, legacy of human influence. And so we have to really broaden our conception of old growth forests then if we're gonna think about managing for these characteristics and even restoring old forest functions, um, not just where we live, but maybe in other regions of the world as well. So this is sort of the overarching theme I hope to um, expand upon today. In this field of old growth silviculture, and that can mean lots of different things to different people, right? So old growth silviculture could mean just simply learning about old growth structure and trying to build more of those characteristics 
into working for us that are managed maybe for a, a variety of functions, it might mean explicitly trying to promote redevelopment of old growth forest structure over time, maybe even restore underrepresented old growth conditions. But it also might mean an adaptation approach, thinking about complexity and you know, functional trait diversity in plants and genetic diversity and other characteristics of old complex systems that we think might be future adapted. So old growth silviculture can mean lots of different things to different people, but basically what we're talking about is promoting or even accelerating rates of forest stand development like you're seeing here in this, this very simplistic pictorial leading to the development of these complex structures over time. And in silviculture then, we need to break this down, break the process of stand development down into all its component pieces. So density dependent mortality, competition among trees, cell thinning, density independent mortality from gap disturbances and, and, and um, uh, uh, canopy disturbances that break apart the canopy and increase horizontal diversity and patch diversity over time disturbances that bring light to the understory and release shade tolerant regeneration, all of these processes that lead to the development of structural complexity over time. And we need to find the silvicultural techniques that emulate each of those component processes of forest stand development. This is, at least in my mind, is how I think of old growth silviculture. Of course, these days we know that it's, it's even more complex than that because you know, we've largely rejected that simplistic idea of linear forest stand development or single pathways of development. And we now know that structural complexity, including late seral or late successional structural complexity can in fact develop a number of different ways. This is Dan Donato's um, well-known study, I think using data from Yellowstone National Park, looking at recovery from the, the 1988 fires there, and, and just understanding that these different pathways of forest development in many cases are strongly influenced by the carryover of biological legacies, the carryover of legacy structure. And depending on how that plays out over time and space, we might have structural complexity um, even persisting through stand development or developing in different ways over time. And I think understanding multiple pathways of development is really important for silviculture because again, it frees us up to think about different ways that we can promote old growth structure maybe in different places and depending on what our stand can, our starting conditions are and what our different management objectives are. In other words, we have flexibility. There are different ways of doing this. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a brief introduction. And, and I thought that with the rest of my talk, I would try to take on four central misconceptions that I see having developed, not just in the US, but um, around the world in the last 10 or 20 years, misconceptions about old growth, misconceptions about silviculture, and misconceptions maybe even about the role of old growth in the future and whether old growth is still even a relevant concept. There, there's a lot of skepticism about everything we're gonna talk about today, and I understand this, um, but I'd like to try to take on that skepticism very, very frankly. So here are the four, four misconceptions that we're going to go through, and I'm going to organ, organize my talk around these, and, and we'll sort of, we'll just go through these one at a time throughout the talk. So the first one is that old growth forests are all the same. In other words, that there's just this one archetypical structural condition for temperate forests that silviculture should be managing for. And I have to say that, you know, I did my PhD in the Pacific Northwest, as Xander said, and I, I was trained in that particular school of thought there. And I, and I thought, okay, well, all temperate forests must be like the Pacific Northwest, and that must be, you know, what we should manage for. And, and over time, I've learned that that's really not true, that actually old growth comes in all different shapes and sizes. So again, we need to think about um, what that range of variability is in the world. Um, and the second misconception is that you know we we know where all the old growth is we we you know we got a pretty good handle on that 
and what's left is pretty well protected, so we don't need to worry about that. Let, let's let's challenge that idea a little bit. Maybe maybe that's true in some places. Maybe it's not in others. Um, the third misconception: old growth forests cannot be restored or, or redeveloped. You know that this was something that developed in centuries past with um, literal little or no human influence. That's that's the uh, ideal, at least. Of course, we all know now with you know, studies of uh, indigenous influences, for example, on temperate forests around the world, that that's really a false understanding of forest dynamics. But, you know, uh, you know, there's, there is this somewhat Puritan view that we, we cannot really go back to what we had, we can't restore them, we can't redevelop them. So we should only focus then on protecting the remaining primary forests that are left. I want to challenge that idea. I want to recognize the conservation of remaining primary forests is essential, but maybe there is the possibility of using active silvicultural techniques to redevelop old forest structures in some places where those are desired. And then fourthly, um, as I've already mentioned, there is skepticism whether old growth is a relative, relevant construct in a rapidly changing world with climate change, with invasive species, with perva pervasive land use, influences, you know, some reject the idea that that old growth is a relative concept for the future. So let's take that on a little bit. Okay, so number one, old growth forests are all the same. This is something that I've 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 been really intrigued by in, in recent years as, as I moved out of the Pacific Northwest and, and began to work on old growth in other regions. And and I've become aware that um, that many of these characteristics that I at least learned about in the Pacific Northwest, like high densities of large trees and vertical complexities and uh, complexity and all these things, that, that, that those, those characteristics don't always hold up in other temperate regions. Um, the, the structural characteristics that we associate with old growth forests are kind of like a menu. They, 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 they appear in different combinations in different places, depending on a whole variety of things like site productivity, like length of the growing season, like depth of the snowpack, like type and intensity and frequency of disturbances. And all of these things shape different types of old growth structures. So I showed you the Pacific North, it's sort of classic Douglas fir, Western hemlock, um, Western red cedar forest here. But you know, what about old growth in other places? Uh, recently, I've been working in Bhutan and the simple, central Himalayan mountains and have been fascinated by the different types of old growth forests there, the Himalayan hemlock, the Himalayan silver fir, and in particular, by the very, very different and, and unique vertical structuring in these forests that is largely a function of these very, very dense and very, very diverse rhododendron understories. So some of you might know that in Bhutan, there are 42 different species of rhododendrons and they grow as shrubs and they grow as mid canopy trees. And they have this radical and, and dramatic effect on the structure of these systems, producing, producing something that's very different from the forests that we see in North America. What about the forests in, in Patagonia and Tierra de Fuego, the, the Nothofagus or Southern beach forests, like these Coiway forests here that you're seeing in Chile? They're fascinating as well. Um, some of the same characteristics we see in North America in terms of large trees and down woody debris and that sort of things, gaps, but also some, some real differences such as tree crowns and canopies that are much more ragged, much more rugged than we see in, in some of our North American temperate forests, largely as a function of, of just constant battering by, by coastal winds and really dense understories of native bamboo that again, change the entire dynamics of these forests. Let's jump to Europe and the classic European beach forests in the, in the in the Alps and in the Carpathians and in um, other parts of the, the Pyrenees and, and the Apennine Mountains, you know, in many ways very similar to, to uh, deciduous old growth Northern American forests. And yet some differences also, very, very closed canopies, very, very little light reaching the forest floor because beach forms this very, very dense uh, closed canopy. And, and, and this means that the dynamics of these systems are actually a little bit different from ours as well. 
Of course, in Europe, they have many other types of old growth, just as we do. We should never generalize about these things. They also have old growth montane coniferous forests, spruce fir systems, and they have other species that are even more rare, like old growth stone pine forests. Here's an example of a, a valley of old growth stone pine in uh, the Slovak Republic. And then just coming back to home again, um, the northern hardwood conifer forests, like the ones that I work on here. Um, many similarities to the Northwest, but also some differences. Uh, we have uh, often chronic wind disturbance in these systems, producing very, very large tip-up mounds, um, extremely gappy systems, sometimes as much as 40% of the stand area can be in, in gaps. And so um, in some ways, maybe even more dynamic than some of the, the temperate old growth systems in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you then that old growth is, is variable globally. And this means also that we need probably a range of silvicultural techniques to promote those characteristics depending on the dynamics that we're working in. Um, I don't just have photographs to support this argument, although it's always tempting just to show you travel photos. Um, we, we, we do have some real empirical data to support this. Um, I and some colleagues performed a, a global analysis of, of, of old growth forest structure a number of years ago, uh, combining data from systems all over the world, like you're seeing here. So Pacific Northwest, uh, Western Hemlock Forest, Coastal Redwood Forest, Northern Hardwood Forest in the Northeast, Southern Beach Forest in, um, in Chile, uh, Korean Pine mixed oak systems in, in East Asia, European beach and, and coniferous systems in Europe. And then of course the eucalyptus regnans or, or mountain ash forests in Southeastern Australia. And, and when we looked at all these systems and tried to quantify the range of variability in, in structure, we came up with this. So now I'm just showing you a couple quick examples of structural indicators. You know, we could spend all day on this. This is just a couple examples. So here we have two features of old forests that are are commonly considered to be indicators of, of late successional structure. So the, the volume of downed woody debris or large logs and the density of large trees. And then on the y-axis, we have different types of forests, deciduous, broadleaf, um, coniferous, et cetera, mixed coniferous, deciduous. And we're comparing mature forests, so middle-aged forests here, the darker color, with old growth forests, the, the lighter, shading here. And what I hope you'll see is that there is a wide range of variability for both age classes globally. So look at these error bars just for coarse woody debris. In some cases, the range of variability between mature forests and old forests overlaps. In other words, sometimes well-developed mature forests, let's say on a highly productive site or with um, you know, a, a more uh, complex disturbance history can have woody debris volumes that are comparable to the lower end of the spectrum for old growth forests. Okay, that's interesting. Um, large tree density, same thing. Very, very wide range of variability for both age classes. And so again, what we, what we see then is that there is a range of variability that exists in nature, and that should be encouraging for us as foresters and as silviculturalists, because it means we have flexibility in terms of the characteristics that we might manage for, but we also have to be cognizant of these, these site differences and differences among systems. But the name of the game is variability, and we need to think about managing for variability at different scales. So both incredibly complex spatial variability within forest stands. And by the way, on the participant list a minute ago, I think I saw my old friend and former student, Sarah Ford. Sarah Ford actually took these photographs at the Rottwald Old Growth Forest in Austria a number of years ago. And you're seeing this incredible complex, spatial complexity in forest structure that, that uh, originates or derives from variation and disturbance processes across space and time. So this variability occurs both within stands, as you're seeing here, and then of course also at landscape scales. And this is really important for forest management more broadly, thinking about creating diverse 
heterogeneous landscapes that have a mix of seral conditions and habitat types and carbon functions and other things. And we might think about the natural disturbance processes that shape landscapes like this and that create this high degree of patch or, or yeah, patch diversity that you're seeing here in this example. This is one of my favorite places in Europe. I think I, I'm not, not sure if I showed this slide before. I think I did the Stone Pine Forest. The, the Koprova Valley in the high Tatras mountains along the border between Slovakia and Poland. And it's, it's a primary forest, wilderness landscape, surprising for Central Europe, shaped over centuries by wind, avalanches, bark beetles, and creating this incredible um, complexity of, uh, of structure. Um, and recently we've we've described structure like this in, in this paper. It just came out this fall in the proceedings of the Royal Society of, of the UK. And we use data points actually from throughout the Carpathian Mountains that you're seeing here. So not just the Tatras Mountains up here, but also other regions of the Carpathians as well. And we showed that things like biodiversity potential and the difference between patches that are taking up carbon at a high rate versus patches that are storing carbon at a high level is entirely dependent on that patch diversity that you're seeing in landscapes like this. In other words, natural disturbances in primary forest landscapes create extreme variability in habitat and in ecosystem function in terms of things like carbon. Okay, so for foresters then we have to think about how we can produce that kind of complexity at landscape scales. That's no easy challenge. Okay, boy, we, uh, we're only on number two here, so we better keep moving. Number two, misconception. We know where all the remaining old growth is. We don't really need to worry about it. We don't need to look for any more. And what's left is, is well protected. Well, you know, there might be some places where that's more true. Um, I, my opinion, feel free to disagree, is that the Pacific Northwest is actually a place where we have probably the best handle on anywhere in the world on, on where the remaining old growth is. And that's because we've had so many iterative inventories of late successional forests, you know, dating back to the, the late 80s, early 90s, and continuing maybe up through this paper here. And so we have a pretty good handle on where those remaining patches are. We also know quite a bit about their protection status, um, which of those, for example, which of those stands are within wilderness areas, national parks, which of them are within late successional reserves designated by the, the Northwest Forest Plan. Of course, it was the inventories, it, it was the availability of the inventories themselves that, that allowed us to uh, create the system of late succession reserves in the first place. My point is that the Pacific Northwest is a place where we, we actually do know quite a bit about where the remaining old growth is. But that's really not true of other parts of the country. Like, for example, where I'm sitting right now in the Northeast, we, we, we do not have an inventory of old growth forests in the Northeastern US. I don't think we have a complete inventory um, anywhere in the Northeast, with the exception of a few select landscapes like the Great Smoky Mountains, maybe in the Southern Appalachians, and a, a few other places where old growth has been intensively studied. So we actually don't know where the old growth is or how much is left. We do know that the situation has changed a lot here, though, and that therefore there may be a role for silviculture in trying to restore more old growth than we have today. So let's take a look at, look, a look at that really quickly here and how things have changed in the Northeastern United States. So we'll use these sort of uh, age class distributions uh, going back to let's say around the time of European settlement of Eastern North America. So roughly 1620 or so when the pilgrims arrived or in Jamestown, right? Okay, so we, we think that the age class distributions looked something like this. Landscapes dominated by old forests with maybe less than 10% of the landscape in young forest condition, um, owing primarily to, to things like beaver and, and Native American burning. But by the mid 19th century, we had profoundly changed 
the age class distribution on our landscapes. Most of the forests had been cleared and we'd converted the landscape to either open agricultural land or as farmsteads were abandoned and settlers moved west to early successional grassland, shrubland and, and early seral forest. So in the mid 19th century then, we had, oh, I seem to be missing that curve on this slide. Oh, it's just not showing up. Uh, that's why I'm confused here. It should be a, a, a negative exponential curve. So a landscape dominated by young forests. Okay, 150 years later, as, uh, as our landscapes have recovered from that history of agricultural land use, we have this bubble of young to mature forests that has redeveloped on our landscape. So very little old forest left. There's some debate about young forests and whether we're within the historic range of variability or maybe still above it, but we have this bubble of mature forest. And the question is, what do we do with that bubble? Do we push some of it uh, back towards a, a young or early seral condition to benefit some of the early successional species that might require that kind of habitat? Or is there an opportunity to move some of this bubble into a late successional old growth condition, either passively through natural forest development, let's say in strictly protected areas, or actively through silvicultural means? I have always argued that these two approaches are not mutually exclusive. We can do some of both just in different places on the landscape. So we can try different things in different places. And, and there might be some real value in this, in, in redeveloping underrepresented late successional and old forest habitats. Um, people will often say, well, early successional habitats have the highest species diversity. Well, in terms of alpha diversity, like diversity on a per acre basis, yes, early successional habitats have very high diversity, but late successional habitats also have high species diversity. This is a figure showing habitat, ver vertebrate habitat associations in the Northeast. And so to optimize overall biodiversity, we need a mix of seral habitats on the landscape. And we need to think about the proportions of each of those. And what is the optimal proportion of seral conditions? So we, we need it all basically, and we need it in the right combination. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that the situation in the Northeast is really different from the Pacific Northwest. We don't know how much old growth there is, we don't know where it is, but we know that there is, would be value in, in restoring old, old growth conditions. The third example that I will be referring to um, throughout the talk today is Central and Eastern Europe. You're, you're getting the idea that I've been working a lot there recently, so I, I can't help myself and, and wanna show you some, some of this, uh, this work. So I'll just be jumping around throughout the talk between Pacific Northwest, Northeastern US and Europe. Okay, so in, in Europe, until very recently, uh, we also didn't know where the old growth was or how much there was, or whether it was even really a viable idea on the Europe, European landscape. And I think that we, we just had this idea that because European forests have been managed for so long and we've had millennia of human influence on landscapes, that there just simply was no old growth left, or maybe only in a few tiny places, like the places that you hear about all the time in the, in the news media. But it turns out that this is just wrong. It turns out that there is actually more old growth left in Europe than people realized. But um, maybe because we didn't know where it was, it has been under a high degree of threat. So for example, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around here. Um, this is some work that I've been involved with in the Carpathian Mountains. This is a region along the, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, borderlands between Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, and Romania. And this is an area where we know there has been a lot of illegal logging of what is supposed to be officially protected old growth forests. And we know that the rates of disturbance and illegal logging have increased really dramatically in recent decades. So this is a study using Landsat or satellite imagery to track these illegal logging trends over time. And, and again, we've been able to show that there's a lot of this 
actually within areas that are supposed to be protected. Uh, the same is true in Romania. Romania actually has one of the largest concentrations of old growth forests left in Europe. And in this uh, paper a number of years ago, we showed that there, there has also been a lot of illegal logging um, within national parks and protected areas in Romania. So maybe because we haven't really recognized the significance of old growth in Europe, it, it faces a much higher degree of threat. In other words, it's much less well protected than let's say in North America. But things are beginning to change. Um, just recently, I've been involved with a couple of studies led by researchers at Humboldt University of Berlin, Germany. And for the first time ever, we've actually conducted a, a European-wide inventory of remaining primary, meaning never cleared, and old forests um, using data sets assembled from throughout the continent and then some uh, predictive modeling to estimate where additional primary forest is likely to occur. That's what you're seeing here in this map, the modeled or predicted occurrence of old growth and primary forests. And we estimate that there might be as much as 1.5 million hectares of primary forest left. Let's see, that's about uh, four and a half million acres to do the conversion. But less than half of it is strictly protected. And what remains is highly fragmented, mostly in smaller stands within, with some notable exceptions, uh, such as the Carpathian Mountains. Okay, so um, I, I hope I've given you some examples then of how question number two plays out in different ways. Some regions of the world, we actually do have a pretty good handle on rem where remaining old growth is. Other regions of the world, we, we have no clue, like in the Northeast, and others like Europe, we're finally getting a, a better handle on, on where the old growth is. Conception, misconception number three. Old growth forests developed in the past uh, with natural disturbance regimes without a high degree of, of human influence, um, but we can't restore them silviculturally. That, you know, they, they, it's, it's a system that it is entirely dependent on natural processes of stand development. Let's challenge that idea for just a second, that old growth forest structure and function cannot be actively restored silviculturally. We're gonna look at examples of uh, places where people are experimenting with silvicultural techniques and in fact, employing silvicultural techniques commercially that in fact are restoring old forest structure that are succeeding. We'll get to those in just a second. This slide reminds me that I wanted to say something else first, which is that let's, let's talk about, first of all, what maybe is and is not old growth silviculture. You know, so I think that in this even broader field of ecological silviculture, of which old growth forest management is arguably a, a subset, in the broader field of ecological silviculture, People, people typically think of retention forestry as what we're talking about. Like, so is this retention forestry, the, the idea of re retaining veteran trees or legacy trees, retaining structure um, when we perform regeneration harvests, and then uh, allowing that legacy structure to persist through forest development? Is that what we're talking about? Um, to answer that question, we can draw on a couple uh, really nice reviews like this one um, came out almost a decade ago now, but a global review of retention forestry systems and that, that, that have looked at sort of what retention does and does not give us. Um, and in my opinion, retention forestry is not the same as old growth silviculture. That's not exactly what we're talking about here. So if we look at sort of like what retention forestry does and what it gives us in terms of legacy tree functions, um, it, it, it's, uh, it gives us some things, but not everything. So as, as described here, a main element of retention forestry is retention of trees and patches at the time of logging to maintain continuity and structural diversity. So that's the key, maintaining some degree of continuity and building a higher degree of, of complexity into managed forests. But let's remember that retention forestry originated back in the early and mid 90s, really as an alternative to clear cutting, 
and to short retention, uh, short, sorry, short rotation, high intensity, even age silviculture. It was meant as an alternative, but it was never really conceptualized as old growth restoration specifically. Okay, so it gives us some things like legacy tree retention, but, but not other things. Okay, so what else can we draw upon to think about what old growth restoration would look like? What about this rapidly developing field of natural disturbance-based forestry? Again, maybe a subfield of this broader umbrella that we refer to as ecological forestry. So this is the, the very useful general technical report that Jerry Franklin and uh, Brian Palick and, and uh, I think um, Bob Mitchell produced um, a number of years ago. And, and sort of conceptualizing the three legs of the natural disturbance-based forestry stool. And, and there's some important concepts here that we can think about for old growth restoration, such as, oops, such as recovery periods. So extended rotations, for example. So um, rotation periods that are long enough for late successional, late seral structure to develop within managed landscapes. That's an important concept. Incorporating legacies into harvest prescriptions. Well, we, we, that comes from retention forestry. We know about that already. But look at this last one or this middle, where is it here? This, uh, this one, the middle one, incorporating natural stand development processes, including partial disturbances into intermediate treatments. So that means thinnings. So what can we, what can we use intermediate treatments for in terms of, accelerating forest development leading to late successional structure. Okay, I would argue that that is the basis of the type of old growth silviculture that you've seen the most of in the Pacific Northwest. It also comprises the heart of the plan for old growth restoration within the Northwest Forest Plan. So I think most of the people on this call, at least those from the Pacific Northwest, know that within the late succession reserves designated by the Northwest Forest Plan, there is an allowance for active management, active silviculture in stands that are less than 80 years of age. So in other words, if you're in a, a young to mature, early mature stand within an, a late succession reserve, you can use thinning to accelerate stand development. So it's the use of these intermediate treatments then that are the, the, the crux of the old growth restoration approach in the Pacific Northwest. You're gonna hear a lot about this in the next two talks in the speaker series from the, the talk by Van Kane and then later Klaus Putnam. So they're gonna tell you all about what they're doing. I'll just give you a little primer that, you know, a lot of it comes down to essentially two basic techniques. The first of which is variable density thinning, typically variable density thinning from below the canopy. In other words, um, uh, marking and harvesting the, the co-dominant and subdominant trees, the less vigorous trees to um, uh, reduce competition leading to the development of, uh, of larger trees. But in some cases also combining a little bit of thinning from above the canopy in terms of increasing light levels and, and freeing up growing space um, for the dominant trees and also in terms of bringing light to the, the understory. So, but, but note the term variable density thinning here, that's the key because that's where the emulation of partial disturbances comes into play. We'll come back to this in just a second. And then the second step in the old growth silviculture of the Pacific Northwest is the idea that in some cases we might need to underplant shade tolerant species like Western hemlock and Western red cedar, where a seed source for those is lacking. And as I know from my own PhD work long ago in the Pacific Northwest, this process of understory redevelopment of shade tolerant conifers is critical to the redevelopment of old growth structure in, in Pacific Northwest coniferous forests, because so much depends on the shade tolerant component in terms of redeveloping that vertical complexity that is so characteristic of old growth forests. The, the silvics of 
uh, northeastern species are completely different. Our stand dynamics are really different. We don't have the same issue with sort of lack of regeneration of shade tolerant species in our understories. But, but for you in the Pacific Northwest, this is a limiting factor. And uh, okay, so we'll come back to that point in just a second and some things that we need to think about. Um, let's just talk again briefly about variable density thinning because again, there's so much work on that in the Pacific Northwest. This again is from the general technical report on natural disturbance based thinning, you know, suggesting the idea that we can conceptualize this maybe as a grid of thinning and thinning intensities and the grid itself might emulate the spatial pattern of intermediate intensity disturbances or partial disturbances like partial wind events, or if this was the Northeast, ice storms or um, limited insect outbreaks that create this, this high degree of spatial complexity in, in forest stand structure. And so the idea with variable density thinning is that we might try to emulate that dynamic, again, to create more patch complexity in our forests. Um, okay, jumping back to this issue of shade tolerant conifer regeneration, why that's such a limiting factor. In my opinion, that um, so much of this depends on uh, proximity of, of seed source. You know, uh, for example, as to whether underplanting of shade tolerant species will be necessary. This is actually what I worked on for my, my PhD long ago in the Pacific Northwest. And I, I looked at the, the effect of remnant patches of old growth trees, like you're seeing in this picture. This is the Trapper Creek Wilderness in the Southern Washington Cascades. Remnant patches, but also um, individual remnant old growth trees, like you're seeing here. The, the, the influence of these remnant trees on rates of understory redevelopment of shade tolerant conifers. So in other words, the, the role that these legacy trees play as seed sources. And of course, if we're talking about shade tolerant species, that means we're, we're mainly interested in the, in the uh, red cedar and Western hemlock. Um, I shouldn't have these pictures of Douglas fir here, but just to give you an idea of what a legacy tree looks like. So how do those trees influence rates of forest stand redevelopment in mature forests that originated from wildfires, let's say 150 years ago. And what I found is that there's this very, very strong effect of remnant old growth shade tolerant seed trees on um, uh, seedling and sapling recruitment rates, and then subsequently the rates of vertical development. And basically the closer you are to these remnant old growth trees, um, the, the faster the rate of old growth redevelopment. So this is a really important lesson for silviculture then, because either we have to make sure that we're close enough to a seed source, or we have to make sure that we leave those seed sources. If we're talking about regeneration harvest, so leaving um, enough cedar and hemlock and, and other um, uh, shade tolerant species on the landscape to provide those seed sources. Okay, so that's just a little bit about old growth silviculture in the Pacific Northwest and, and some of the concepts that you'll be hearing about in the next two webinars. Okay, so as promised, now we're gonna, we're gonna jump to the other two case studies, uh, Northeast and Europe. Okay, so Northeastern US. I thought I'd share with you a little bit about my own work here on old growth silviculture. I've been interested in this idea of actively promoting redevelopment of old growth now for, for more than 20 years. When I first came to the University of Vermont 21 years ago, actually, I started up this study called the Vermont Forest Ecosystem Management Demonstration Project. You're seeing here in this picture, our main project area on, on the side of Mount Mansfield. And you're seeing these experimental treatment units, the blue squares, each of which is uh, five acres in size. I'll explain more about the experiment in just a minute. We started the study in 2001. Um, we had a couple of years of pre-treatment data collection. The experimental treatments were introduced in 2003. And then we've been back out there almost every year since then remeasuring the plot. So we have a pretty nice time series now on uh, forest responses to these old growth 
treatments, old growth silviculture treatments. The study is replicated at three locations, uh, Mount Mansfield, the UVM Jericho Research Forest, and we've also drawn on data from a similar study across the lake at Paul Smith's College in the Adirondacks. It's a randomized block design, meaning we have a variety of treatments that are randomly applied in blocks, and then the blocks are replicated among these three sites that you're seeing here. Um, in this study, we've tested uh, a somewhat unconventional approach, which I've called structural complexity enhancement. Structural complexity enhancement, or SCE, is the old growth restoration approach. Um, this is the way in which we are trying to accelerate rates of forest development, leading over time to those old growth conditions. The study compares SCE alongside modified selection harvesting systems, a modified single tree selection system and a modified group selection system. More on that in just a second too. Okay, so the way we approach this, this whole question of old growth restoration, like how do we do that, was to start with as much research we could find on the dynamics and the characteristics of old growth forests themselves. And fortunately, because we have quite a bit of old growth forest here in the Adirondacks, in the White Mountains, and in a few other places, we had good empirical data we could draw on to learn about the dynamics and characteristics of old forests here. We then developed, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. We then uh, identified silvicultural techniques that could be used to, um, to modify or direct those dynamics that we learned about from old forests. We tried them, we used them in tandem, uh, as I said, 20 years ago or so. And then we've been um, comparing the effect of structural complexity enhancement against, against the conventional selection harvest systems ever since. Uh, I know that there are probably some diehard silviculturists in the, in the meeting today. So here you go, here's the actual prescriptions that we used. Um, these are basically modified BDQ prescriptions. So BDQ, for those of you who remember your, your textbook silviculture, refers to the residual basal area that you, you intend to leave after you harvest a stand, the maximum tree diameter or tree size that you intend to, to leave, and the Q factor, which is basically the form or the shape of the diameter distribution. It describes a negative exponential distribution that foresters historically have called the reverse J curve. Okay, that's a BDQ prescription in classic textbook selection silviculture. We played around with those. We modified these both to retain more structure than would be typically retained at harvest in, in our forests, and also to produce very unconventional diameter distributions that are closer to what we actually find in old growth forests. I'll try to explain this in just a minute. Okay, so these are the modified BDQ prescriptions. And then otherwise, the way the old growth silviculture works is like this. In this column, we have a, a, a variety of structural objectives that we're hoping to achieve over time. And then we have a whole variety of different silvicultural techniques here in this column, each of which is targeted at one or more of these structural objectives. So basically taking everything we can from silviculture and you know, throwing it at this objective of accelerating stand development processes leading to, the, to these structural objectives. That's the way this works in a nutshell. Okay, now just to elaborate on a couple of the specifics for those that are interested. And I mentioned this unconventional BDQ, residual basal area, maximum tree diameter, uh, Q factor prescription. For the old growth silviculture, it, it, it works like this. The, the Q factors that we used form this rotated sigmoid or S-shaped diameter distribution like the distribution we find in old growth forests. 
And rather than cutting our forest to a classic J curve or negative exponential distribution or balanced diameter distribution, whatever term you want to work or use, we, we cut these forests to this rotated sigmoid distribution. So there are a couple of reasons why we did that, which I'll explain in a second. But just for those of you who maybe are not familiar with this kind of silviculture, it works like this. You start with the diameter distribution that you have before harvest, that's the dotted line. You superimpose the diameter distribution that you intend to cut the forest to, and then you cut the difference. Okay, so if we superimpose the pre-harvest distribution on the rotated sigmoid, you see that we tend to concentrate our harvest and our marking in the mid-sized trees, the co-dominant trees. And because our, our future desired distribution actually tails off into tree sizes that are larger than anything that we even have right now, it means that we basically leave the large tree sizes alone. We, we touch them only very lightly. And what this is doing is it's shifting the growing space allocation in your forest toward, in a way that favors recruitment of trees into these large tree sizes. In other words, by reducing competition in the mid-sized trees, it will allow more of them to recruit into the largest tree sizes. So we're playing around with what silviculturists call growing space allocation. Again, to promote development of large trees and to shift the basilary distribution into the larger tree sizes over time. So very complicated silviculture, but that's the way it works. We tried some other things as well, like a, ver a variety of gap sizes and structural conditions. So different gaps, sizes, shapes, and also some degree of structural retention within gaps. We used a technique called crown release, which basically means thinning around the crowns of uh, dominant canopy trees. Remember, these are deciduous hardwood trees that are able to put on more crown if they have greater access to light and to growing space. So we use this crown release technique to free up growing space with the idea that this would develop larger trees faster. And this was uh, some supporting data from Northern Wisconsin that showed that that was likely to work. And then we used another technique, um, other techniques to enhance both down woody debris volumes as well as the standing dead tree uh, densities. Um, and that included, in some cases, actually pulling trees over uh, with skitters and cables or pushing trees over with tree shears to create tip-up mounds like this, uh, because tip-up mounds are another very important habitat feature in old forests that are often underrepresented. And we can create these silviculturally too, and we can even harvest the logs sometimes, depending on um, the kind of site that we're operating on. Okay, I should probably go through this really quickly because we're, we're coming up on an hour here and I'm sure many of you need to leave, but over the years, we've looked at a whole variety of responses to this technique, structural complexity enhancement, and we think that it's working quite well. It's working both in terms of promoting these old growth characteristics, as well as the biodiversity responses that we care about and the functional responses like carbon and hydrology that we also care about. We've looked at lots of different things over the years. I'll just quickly mention a couple. Um, uh, so for example, tree regen regeneration is critically important here. Um, we, we rely almost entirely on natural regeneration in the Northeast, but we have big problems with beech bark disease and competition with beech sprouts and um, uh, acid deposition and herbivory and earthworms and all kinds of things that are making it very difficult to regenerate. Uh, the, the, the desirable species that we want. Structural complexity enhancement actually has done a pretty good job, look, that's here at, at promos, promoting diversity both in the seedling class and in the sapling class. And we think that that's primarily because of the high degree of spatial variability. In other words, the complexity of the light environment that this technique produces, much like natural disturbances would, favoring a variety of species with different shade tolerances.
the fungal response has been amazing. This is the uh, fungal species richness in SCE compared to the controls and the conventional harvest systems. And we've seen this dramatic increase in the richness of the fungal community, not just decomposers, but also mycorrhizal fungi and edible species and, and a whole variety of things. Um, and we can attribute that to the enhancement of dead wood, both standing and downed, leading to the highest um, change in species richness here, as you're seeing in this um, uh, cart figure. Okay, then a little bit on carbon. This is uh, Sarah Fo Ford's work. I think Sarah's on, on the call today. And um, we've been very pleased um, at the carbon performance. And we've shown that the SCE came within about 16% after 10 years uh, of the biomass or, or above ground carbon storage um, that the unharvested or control units had uh, as compared to about 45% in the conventional harvest. So much a higher degree of carbon retention to begin with, but also um, greater harv uh, carbon levels uh, further down the road. And that's, a, that, that's due both to the higher initial retention of carbon, as well as surprisingly um, higher growth rates actually in dominant trees in the structural complexity enhancement treatment. Um, I could explain that um, if I had more time, but we should probably move on. Okay, so um, SCE, structural complexity enhancement, has been promising. It, it, it has seemed to accomplish many of the objectives that we, um, that we intended. But in the Eastern US, we're seeing a whole variety of approaches used now to promote older forest structure. So not just this kind of modified selection harvesting system, like I just described, but also a, a, a wide range of gap-based silvicultural approaches, such as irregular shelterwood methods, or what some people call multi-cohort or multi-age silviculture that very closely emulate partial disturbances. So in other words, instead of managing for truly uneven aged forests, we, we can manage for two-aged stand conditions or three age stand conditions. And, and we can mix and match in different ways and different shapes and sizes, depending on the, the, the silvics of the species involved, depending on our timber management objectives and, and everything else. And this is working well, it's working well. We're building more complexity into our landscape and these multi-cohort irregular shelter wood systems seem to give foresters, especially a, a much higher degree of flexibility in terms of the silviculture that they can use, especially because they tend to open up the canopy a little bit more, they bring more light to the forest floor, which means that they are often somewhat uh, more successful at regenerating sugar maple and yellow birch and other species that we're, we're having more difficulty regenerating now. Um, and they, yeah, they have an, a number of other uh, kind of operational uh, advantages as well that, that, um, that I think foresters are excited about. So I just wanted to quickly recognize that these types of techniques are now being actively used in different ways in different places. Okay, then the final example, and I'll try to do this really quick. We're going we're gonna to jump back to Europe and then, and then maybe we'll finish up now here. So I mentioned that, that the situation is changing rapidly in Europe. You know, just 10 years ago, uh, you know, no one was talking about old growth and, and nobody thought that old growth was even important on the European landscape. That has profoundly changed in recent decades. And we've seen a flurry of activities, for example, under the World Heritage Convention designating a European system, uh, a European wide system of old growth forest reserves, world heritage sites for beach. We've seen um, protection and restoration of old growth forests explicitly um, incorporated into the EU's biodiversity strategy and uh, other initiatives at the continental scale. And, and now all of a sudden there is interest in, in figuring out not just how to protect the old growth that's left, but how to actually use silviculture to restore more of it. 
Um, again, a study I've been involved with, with the folks at Humboldt University in Berlin, we performed this gap analysis on remaining old growth continent-wide, and we looked at the protection status. So where is old growth um, well protected? Where is it protected, but the protection level could be improved? Where is it not protected at all? That's the protection gap. And where are there important areas within and near protected areas where we could use restoration to restore more old forest? So we now have a handle on where we could do this and where those benefits would be. But just like in North America, in Europe, the question is, what kind of silviculture would we use for that? How would we do it? Um, Europe has a long history, maybe even as much as a century of experience with what they call close to nature silviculture, which is basically what we would think of as selection harvesting, but with some differences, mostly group selection silviculture, but also some single tree. And you're seeing, and, and, and you're seeing some examples of this here in Bohemia. And you know, they, they do this very well in their beach forests and some of their mixed species forests, they are exceptionally skilled at this close to nature silviculture. But there's this question, you know, does that really give us the old growth structure that we're talking about? You know, exactly the same kind of question that we were asking 20 years ago in Eastern North America. You know, does classic selection harvesting really give us old growth structure? It gives us some things like gaps, it gives us vertical complexity, but it often reduces the representation of large trees. It completely cleans out the dead tree component. They tend to not leave any dead trees either standing or downed. There are no tip up mounds. There's very little spatial complexity in the for these forests. So arguably there's still a lot of room for improvement with these close to nature silvicultures uh, close to nature silviculture systems in Europe. And that's why there are a number of experiments underway now in, in, in several places, Ukraine, Hungary, Czech Republic, Germany, testing out a variety of approaches that would enhance complexity in these systems. Exactly the kind of thing that we've been doing in North America now for 20 or 30 years, the Europeans are, are really getting going with this now. Um, they're particularly interested in, again, these irregular shelterwood methods, these multi-cohort systems. Okay, so uh, this idea of old growth restoration is, is not um, you know, exclusive to North America. This is something that people are, are trying all over the world. I should probably end right there. I really think we've We've gone long enough. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about old growth in the future, um, but maybe we can do that another time. So Xander, I'll just close with these final, final thoughts. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll summarize what I've said this way. Structure and old growth tempered force is highly variable, but provides services of, of universal value like biodiversity and carbon. Um, inventories vary among uh, region, uh, regions as does degree of protection. So there's still a lot of work that we need to do in that area. The option for active restoration of, sil uh, of structural and functional characteristics of old growth for tempered forests is one that we can think about in, in regions throughout the world. And again, active restoration can complement passive protection and, and protected areas based approaches. Those two things can go hand in hand. Um, I didn't have much time to talk about number four, but I am a believer uh, that conservation and management of old growth systems can be an element of adaptive management in the face of climate change. Um, maybe that is a, 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 talk, a, a talk for a future date. Um, okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for sticking it out. And if anybody wants to ask a few questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill. That that was great. And um, I tried to add some of the references you mentioned in the chat window. So those are available for folks. And um, feel free to type questions in the chat window. We had one come in um, 
asking, uh, Bill, if you looked at economic impacts for landowners who might adopt structural complexity focused management in the Northeast. Yeah, we did. Uh, somehow that slide dropped out of my presentation, but um, <laughs> we actually put a lot of work into the understanding the economics. Um, and of course, to do that, you need to track both the operational side of the equation, the operational expenses, as well as the revenue side. And, and we did both. And we, we learned that structural complexity enhancement actually performed at a, at a moderate level financially. The, the costs were only somewhat greater than the other treatments and the revenue uh, was, was moderate to, to comparable to the conventional systems. And, and using a sensitivity analysis, we learned that SCE can work economically if the conditions are right. So you need to be on a moderate to highly productive site. You need to have enough merchantable volume at first to make the economics work. Um, you need favorable markets, uh, you know, uh, prices, um, fuel costs play a role, uh, proximity to mills and trucking distances. All of those things matter just like they would for any type of harvest. But when you throw everything into the mix, SCE performed at a moderate level. And what this means is that it's never going to maximize profit. But for landowners like uh, land trusts, the Nature Conservancy, uh, landowners that are maybe primarily interested in other objectives like carbon or bird habitat or something else, um, and maybe maximizing revenue is not the primary concern, this technique will at a minimum pay for itself and might even generate enough profit to be desirable in that respect. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, another question came in, um, just direct message to me about uh, legacy trees as seed sources and wondering if you could explain the difference between legacy trees as a seed source and somewhat younger trees as a seed source. So you made a point of, uh, particularly I think in the Pacific Northwest example of right. those legacy trees because of the seed source element. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, in my work, I didn't look at the effect of age specifically, but I did review a lot of literature that had looked at that. And uh, as you have to do as a PhD student, and I remember, there's a lot of good work that's showing that seed production specifically, uh, specifically in shade tolerant conifers really increases dramatically with age and size, and in particular access to light above the canopy. So younger trees are investing their resources primarily in growth because of competition. But once they get up above the canopy, um, they start um, shifting uh, photosynthate allocation to, to cone and seed production. So there is a relationship with, with age, but you know, it's a fair question. You know, could you have reasonable seed production, let's say in mature trees, provided they had enough access to light? And I would guess that the answer is yes. Um, but I, again, I didn't look at it specifically in my study. Yeah, great. Um... Let's see, John asked a question about shifting the current young mature forest bubble. So we're talking sort of Northeast uh, uh, area towards young or old growth forests. What do the total effects on carbon stocks and rates of sequestration look like for these different scenarios? So for example, is net carbon sequestered over hundred years in an old growth greater, less than, or equal to carbon sequestered in a young forest that's harvested every 20 years. So this, this sort of trade-off between um, the, the rapid growth of younger forests and, and older forests. And yeah. look at that, that because you had that nice graph of where the sort of uh, in the Northeast, how the age has changed over time, the age distribution. Right. Um... Boy, I mean, this is the million dollar <laughs> question that comes up every time. And, and those of, of you who work in the carbon world know that we're you know, constantly struggling with this question. And the answer is very complicated. Basically, no, older forests don't sequester carbon at a higher rate. Sequestration means rates of uptake through photosynthesis. 
And that is higher in a younger, rapidly growing forest, at least on an individual tree basis. Older forests, though, store more carbon. They think of them as reservoirs of sequestration past. You know, it's like the carbon that has already been sequestered over centuries of work. And now it's stored in this biomass and this vegetation. And study after study after study has shown that if cut and converted to a younger forest, even a younger forest with higher growth rates and higher rates of sequestration, there is a net flux of carbon to the atmosphere. And then you can get into all kinds of other carbon accounting questions like um, the, the carbon that's transferred into the wood product stream or mm -hmm. substitution effects for using wood in place of concrete and steel and products with a high carbon footprint. And so this carbon accounting gets more and more and more complicated. Um, my opinion, uh, the kind of professional short answer is that we need like a portfolio of carbon management strategies. We need a diverse landscape and we need to try different things in different places. Old growth has the advantage of storing a lot of carbon. Younger forests have higher sequestration rates and actively managed forests can produce wood that will have substitution effects. And we need all of these strategies in our portfolio. And I think the net effect is, is maximized that way. That way. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to share a file here in the chat box. Am I, um, Xander? I couldn't find a way uh, to do this, but- I don't I have, know. I have a paper that goes through it, this in great detail. If, if you wanna email the, me, the, I'd be happy to send it to you. Yeah, the, the, in, is it the enhanced carbon storage through management, that paper? It, it's not, I actually have a book chapter um, that oh. dives into this debate about old versus young forests much more explicitly. And I would love to share that. Yeah, um, so maybe what we'll do, because I, I don't think we can share that through Zoom, but um, we can share it. Um, uh, yes, that's it. That's the citation there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, folks who are interested, we can. We Actually, can yes, you were right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, that I, I think your last comment is a great place to uh, to wrap up. Uh, we've imposed on your time quite a bit here, but it it is. Um, I, I you've opened the door to a lot of complex discussions, and I think we'll get into at least parts of them in the, the following uh, webinar series installments. Um, and also this issue of kind of that portfolio of management approaches is something that um, we've been talking a lot about within the Forest Stewards Guild and the Membership and Policy Council. So I'm gonna share that little quote there at the end, Bill, with uh, some of that team as well. Uh, I think it's really important um, you know, at this moment in time, both from a climate change perspective and also some of the investments that are being made through that uh, recent U.S. congressional infrastructure bill. So uh, really, really good conversation. And I'll just take the time to thank you again. Uh, you clearly put a lot into crafting this narrative on your uh, uh, presentation, and it really came together well. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for sticking it out. Yeah, hope to see okay. everybody come back for future installments.